Man, God bless you. I'm so glad to be here. Um, just blessed, blessed to be here and um, to meet so many of you. Can I just start off by saying thank you? Um, those of you that come here, um, you're able to do something that I have yet to have the ability to do. God gives us, gives us gifts in different ways. And I think that perhaps it is 38 years of having been a very active Mormon, someone who was all in. Even now, five, six years later, I have a very difficult time evangelizing LDS people. Um, there are things that I do well. There are things that I do poorly. And we're going to talk a little bit about some of those uh, here in just a minute. But I want to thank you for having the courage and the, the conviction to do this. Um, we pray for you. My wife and I pray for you. We rejoice and praise God for people like you. And I want you to know that. I hope you understand the sincerity of that because it's a people that need you so desperately. They need Jesus and they need people to bring the good news. But I want you to think about this for a second. I want you to think everything that you believe now. I want, and this is going to be hard for you, but I want you to take this for a second and think about everything you believe, everything you know, everything you trust in crumbling before your eyes. Just crumbling. Everything that you have planted your feet on. Everything that you were absolutely certain was true. Everything that you were willing to fight and die for crumble underneath your feet as you come to realize that it was all a facade of historical untruth. As you start to realize that your life was built the foundation was created and that what you have passed on to your children is a lie. That was my reality six years ago. As the truth of what I had come to believe, as the truth of what I was dedicated to crumbled underneath my feet. And it was the most devastating thing I have ever, ever gone through. So here's the first thing I want you to know. As you are going out and you are evangelizing the LDS people, you, you, you read their beliefs and you learn about them and you learn what they believe. And you think, how could anyone believe this? How could anyone think this? And you may have a, a tendency to, to write it off as, well, they couldn't possibly really truly believe this, so it should be easy to talk to them. No. As you're talking to them, they believe it. They absolutely, positively are convinced they are right. And they, 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 they know they're right. And so it can get very frustrating for you. When my wife and I came to Christ... In 2013, when, when he blew our minds in a way that, that only Jesus can and, and just wrecked us and this whole new creation, the whole born again creation that was founded on Jesus Christ was incredible and we were so eager to share it. Um, you've seen these books, I'm sure. I wrote a little chapter, chapter nine. It is about evangelizing your family. And many of the truths and many of the principles that are in this can be used with you today, this week, in the next couple of weeks as you are evangelizing and helping LDS people. When we came out of Mormonism, it was not <coughs> quiet. It was not a silent thing. In fact, it was the exact opposite. It was one of the most... And I just dropped Aaron's thing. It was one of the most vocal things that you could possibly have imagined. In fact, I had served in politics. I'd been in the state legislature for three terms. And only in Utah would this happen. But it did happen. This is a copy of 
portion of the front page of the Salt Lake Tribune. Salt Lake Tribune, largest newspaper in the state of Utah. And it says, ex-Utah Representative Carl Wimmer, God guided me away from Mormonism. And it was an entire article on the front page of the Salt Lake Tribune about me and my wife leaving the LDS Church. Because I had just recently run for United States Congress and was fairly well known in political circles at the time. I wanted to crawl under a rock. Or at least hide in my room. I wanted to call in sick for a month and pull the covers over my head and cower as this was on the front page of the Salt Lake Tribune exposing everything. Wow, okay. Uh, yes, I was married in the LDS temple. I was a leader in the LDS church as elders quorum president. And now I'm leaving the church and it's on the front page. And I'm in a small town where... Uh, Every one of my neighbors is LDS. It was rough. But it was to God's glory as other people reached out to us and said, we're having questions too. How can I get through this? What is the process? Where are you going? See, the sad truth is when people lose their faith in Mormonism, they lose their faith in God most of the time. That's why it's so critical what you're doing. When the church and God are so intertwined. And Mormons, although they don't, they will claim they don't worship their church, the fact is, when they lose their faith in the church, the vast, overwhelming majority of them go agnostic or atheist. They lose their faith in God because they're so intertwined. It is so important as you are teaching that you teach them the difference between what their church is and what God really is. So important. I want to go over just a couple of things. <clears throat> when we came out of Mormonism, the, the thing that we insisted on was we were so excited, we couldn't understand why other people were not super stoked for Jesus, right? Man, I was talking to the lady at the gas station who's ringing me up. I'm talking to the lady at the grocery store. I'm like, man, do you know Jesus? You, you, how's your relationship with God? And they're all looking at me cross-eyed. I'm asking the waitresses, can we pray for you before we eat? And they're looking at me like I'm weird. And I'm like, why don't you guys, why aren't you guys excited? This is the greatest news in the history of the earth. You're more excited over an iPod. You're more excited about the new Apple iPhone or whatever the case is than Jesus Christ. How could that be? And... I, I'm thinking back, that's how I was. For 38 years, I was just ho-hum, you know, the Bible comes out. You know, the quad comes out, I should say. The quad, it's the Bible, the Book of Mormon, the Pearl of Great Price, the Doctrine and Covenants, all wrapped into one. It's thicker than my ESV study Bible. And you pack it under your arm, you go to church. And then when you come home, I heave it back up on the shelf, and I don't think about God again until next Sunday. But this, when God wrecked me and when I was born again... Holy cow, I wanted to tell the world about Jesus. And my wife and I did everything wrong. We did everything wrong. One story that will confirm how wrong it was is how we notified her parents. And I'm going to tell you this real quick, and then I'm going to go through just a couple of things that you can use in helping you evangelize to the LDS people. So here's the story. We had come out of Mormonism. It was nice and quiet. We hadn't told anybody except one of Sherry, my wife, her brother, who we knew would be cool because he considers going hunting and going to church. And so we kind of knew he'd be cool with what we're doing. And, um, and it was Easter Sunday, and we're out at her family's house, and we're riding four-wheelers, and I go and dump a four-wheeler on myself and three other girls. I, I was heroic and saved the girls and hurt myself. Um, Anyway, I have to go to the hospital. So her little brother takes me to the hospital. And, um, of course, the nurses come in. we got to x-ray you, right? So they whip out the old scissors and cut off my clothes. And voila, I'm not wearing the holy Mormon garment. And I knew at that moment, all these things, I know this is weird to you. I know this is weird to you that don't understand it, but... LDS people promised to wear the garment night and day, all the time, whatever the case may be. And nobody knew nothing up to this point. And I knew at that moment my brother's thinking, oh, he's living in sin. He's cheating on my sister. He's doing this. He's doing that. What has happened? And, and I'm like, I got to tell you something. <laughs> We've left the church. He's like, 
his eyes are this big. He's like, what? And I'm like, yep. And, and so I told him, I'm like, you've got to keep it quiet until Sherry can tell your parents. He's like, okay, okay. But we knew t- t- time was ticking, right? Time was ticking. And so I told Sherry, I'm like, we are busted. Matter of fact, I'm texting her, we're busted. We are so busted. You, you should have taken me to the hospital. Why, what are you thinking? They take your clothes off in front of everybody at the hospital. And so I'm like, we're so toast. And uh, she's, we're in panic mode. We go home and we're like, we got to tell your parents. I'm like, invite them to dinner. She's like, no. She's like, no, I got to write them an email. I'm like, oh, wow. Breakups over email, it's so hard. So she writes them this email and it was wonderful. It was, your great parents, we love you. Uh, you set a foundation for us. It was everything a parent would want to hear, plus we're leaving the LDS church. And matter of fact, we've left. We have a pastor, his name's Rodney, he's got a ponytail. Um, <laughs> uh, and has an earring, so yeah, we've, we've gone off the deep end here. So we prepare this beautiful email. And we're like, it's good, it's good, it's good. Go ahead and send it. So she sends it. We worked on it for a couple days. She sends it on April 1st. April 1st. April Fool's Day. I'm like, holy crud, it's April Fool's Day. I mean, God is enjoying this. He's just up there laughing. He has a sense of humor, I'm telling you right now. He is enjoying this entire process. He doesn't need no video games. He has us. And... and, (laughs) And so she has to follow it up. Sorry, this is not April Fool's joke. We just noticed it was April 1st. We apologize. This is awful. And so it was terrible. Okay, so now here comes the hard part. Um, The part that was not very fun. And the part that you, as you are out there preaching, you're asking Mormons to go through this. Okay? Okay. Matthew 19, 29 says that no one, you know, if you leave father, mother, house, brother, sister, you'll be rewarded eternally, okay? Most of us never think we ever really have to do that. But as you are asking LDS people to consider the truth claims of their church, that's exactly what you're asking them to do. You see, because we were lucky We were lucky because my wife and I came to Christ at nearly the same time. I was born again. I can peg it. February 22nd, 2013. I can peg it because that's the day that God blew my mind when I come to realize who Jesus really was. And my life has never, ever been the same since. My wife was more methodical, and that's just the way she is. And so it took her a little while longer, but I still remember coming home from work one day. She's sitting on the bed. She has the Bible open. She looks up at me, and she says... Jesus is God. I'm like, oh, spike the football. Yes, he is God. And she's reading John 1, John 1, 1, John 1, 14. She's reading that entire section and she gets it. So that happened to her. We were very lucky in that sense. And we're very lucky with our extended family for the most part. But that first few months was a nightmare. Her parents stopped talking to us. Her entire, her entire family, with the exception of the brother who likes to go hunting, um, stopped talking to us. They wouldn't answer calls. They wouldn't answer texts. They wouldn't answer emails. It was heartbreaking and devastating. But through the entire time, the hope and the love that we had found in Christ, we realized that no matter what happened, and we sat there and we talked, no matter what happens, no matter where this goes, no matter how this ends, Jesus is worth any cost. And we decided that, and we decided to push forward. And we decided to try to show them love, but the problem was all the things we did wrong before that. We wanted to justify ourselves. We wanted to show them, because the thing thing is, when you know you're right, when you absolutely, positively know you are right, and you're arguing with someone who you know they're wrong, but they don't know they're wrong. Oh, it's frustrating. And we wanted so bad, so badly to convince them. And I mean, you don't even know, do you, do you even, half these people didn't even know Joseph Smith was a polygamist. I don't know if they still know this. And they just don't know the historical truth claims and the problems with 
historical Mormonism. They don't understand the problems of the Book of Mormon. They don't understand how different it is from the gospel of Jesus Christ. And they would not listen. And the more they wouldn't listen, the more we pushed. And eventually, they blocked us on Facebook. Ooh, that is the kiss of doom, right? <laughs> right? I mean, you know, like, somebody doesn't answer your call. Someone doesn't answer your text. Someone ignores you. Okay, but when they block you on Facebook, stuff's getting real, right? Okay? <laughs> and it was getting real. And we're like, holy crud, what did we do? We just got to back off, I guess. I don't know. We got to back off. And so we made just about every mistake you could possibly make. And so when we finally decided we're going to start just loving them and, 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 and doing, I guess, lifestyle evangelism, which is living our life in Christ and letting people see it, and that was a hard decision to make, but we decided we had to do it. We had to let others like Rob and, and Aaron who go and actually street preach and talk face to face to LDS people. We had to let them do their job and we had to back off. Um, my wife, another story, my wife went up, uh, she was taking cookies to some relatives and it was pouring rain, pouring rain. She shows up and she knocks on the door and they won't answer the door for her. They wouldn't let her in. They left her out there in the pouring rain. And um, they knew she was there. But they, there was a shunning and there was a, there was a pushing away that was devastating to us. And so we decided we were going to just simply dedicate ourselves to praying for our family. And so we did. We would pray and we'd pray. I mean, we saturated this situation in prayer and we still do. And we covet your prayers to pray for her family and for my family. But um, things got better. Naturally, things got better. We can't talk about the Lord around them. We can't talk about anything religious. We can't talk about the single most important thing in our life which is the gospel of Jesus Christ. But we can talk about the weather, and we can talk about football, and we can talk about other things. And over a period of time, things started to happen. I'll give you a couple examples. Through living the gospel, and by living out loud, and I know sometimes you're like, man, we're supposed to not... <coughs> You know, it's prideful to show what we're doing or whatever, but if you can humbly live out loud and live for Christ, people see it. People do see it, and your family members see it, and they watch. And so when one of Sherry's family members, close family members, had a spiritual question not long ago, he did not turn to his bishop. He did not turn to his parents. He did not turn to his LDS friends, he turned to Sherry and he emailed her and talked to her about a situation that he was going through. And we praise God for that. When my daughter, who's in high school, started a prayer group at the high school, she started a Christian prayer group. There, there's only two evangelical Christians in the entire school. Um, one who doesn't really live it uh, all that much and doesn't really know where she stands, and, my, and then there's my daughter. But she still passed out invitations every week. And as those invitations would be shredded and thrown in front of my daughter's locker and piled there every week, she continued on. A, as people started to complain, and as a certain city councilman who says that Wimmer's always digging up trouble tried to actually convince my boss to shut my daughter's prayer group down at the school. And so we did contact the uh, Alliance Defending Freedom just to let them know what was going on. As those things were going on, we had the opportunity to go help my wife's parents build a room. And casually that conversation was brought up. And to this day, it was one of those moments where you're like, you're blown away by what God is doing. As Sherry's father got angry on behalf of what was happening to his granddaughter. You see, me and my wife, we're crazy, but don't mess with the granddaughter, right? And so he's like, he's like, what? You mean a city council was trying to shut her prayer group down? What if it was a Mormon prayer group? He wouldn't do anything like that if it was a Mormon prayer group. But because she doesn't believe everything, they're going to attack my granddaughter? Oh, and he was, I'm like, 
wow, you go, you go. And it was awesome. And then the, the, the pinnacle of where we've reached so far through prayer and through lifestyle evangelism was an ma- incredible opportunity where my wife went out and had dinner with her parents. And afterwards, they're just sitting there talking. And one thing led to another. And for the next hour and a half, my dad, not, not, or my, not my dad, her dad, my father-in-law, sat there and listened as she talked and went through the Bible and went through verses. And she could actually see, God opened her eyes to see the conflict going on in his mind. The in-your-face didn't work for our family. And it actually hurt us as we tried to push it. And I think in many ways it's because those personal relationships, the in-the-face isn't going to work. You have to have a third party do that. My point being this. You have to understand that conversion to Jesus is a process. John chapter 3 likens it to being born again. Well, being born takes nine months from conception to here's junior, right? (laughs) Being born again is a spiritual process. David Early, who um, evangelist and and gospel writer, um, compares it to being born. And if you look back on your conversion, your coming to Christ, how, how long did it take? How many years did you sit through Awana? How many years did you sit through little Bible camps before it clicked? And you're like, yes, I understand. I'm a sinner and I need Jesus. When I look back over my lifetime, I see that my birth process probably began nearly 20 years ago. As Loving Christians planted seeds. Just a seed here, just a seed there. And as I rejected this seed, I'm like, get that seed away from me. I don't want to hear nothing about nothing. Because I am Mormon, and I stand with Joseph Smith. That was one of my favorite things to say. But these seeds continued to be planted. And God was drawing me. He was drawing me without me even knowing because of the work of good evangelicals, good Christians who took the time to plant seeds here and there. And so let me encourage you, because if you're here for the entire pageant, you're here for a long time and you will get, you'll be exhausted. I saw a prayer request out here that said, pray for me, I'm already exhausted. And so I took a second, I prayed for that person. And uh, I don't know who it was, but all of you are going to fit that mold by the time you're done here. You're going to be exhausted. You're going to be exhausted physically, but you're going to be exhausted mentally. And doggone it, you might be exhausted spiritually. Because you are going to feel like if you've ever taken a really crappy shovel, that's all I have in my house, okay? Really bad shovels, really bad tools. I am not a fixer-upper guy. And take a really bad, rusty, bendable shovel, and you try to dig into the concrete-like earth in the middle of August, and it's like, it's bending your shovel, and, and you're like, you're getting nowhere. You're digging for an hour, and you're three inches deep. That's what it's like sometimes here, okay? But if I could give you any encouragement, it is this. I never, ever, ever thought I would leave the LDS church. Never. Man, I was, I was so Mormon, a coffee table was against the word of wisdom. Okay? <laughs> that is how Mormon I was. Yet Christ broke me and found me. And if he can find me, he can find others, and he does. And so be encouraged that the seed you're planting... That, that, that little itty-bitty, even if it feels like you're doing nothing, you are doing something. And it could be 20 years from now. It could be five years from now. It could be <clears throat> 30 years from now. It could be whenever God's timing is, your seed is going to germinate. It will germinate. And so be encouraged at that. Be encouraged that every conversation you're having is of benefit, even when it feels like, wow, that was worthless. 
that was useless. Oh, wow, that was intense. Every time you hear that, every time you say that, just know that you've planted a seed that could change a life. See, I went from being full on believer to now pastoring a church in Gunnison. Praise God. Praise God for what he does. Live in that. Rejoice in that. Rejoice in the victories. Every time someone comes to Christ, the angels celebrate. You should too. Every time you plant a seed, take a second and celebrate in your heart to know that you planted a seed. And even though they act like they hate you, and even though it gets tiresome, and even though you are just feeling like you're not going anywhere, realize that you are. Realize that you are. And saturate it with prayer. Um, <clears throat> in one of the sections of my book, it says, understand the primacy of loving your LDS family. That doesn't just mean loving your LDS family. It means loving the LDS people. I remember, I wanna, I remember um, oh, about a month, I was still active Mormon. In fact, uh, you can hear my story, it's online. But I was sitting in elders quorum in our ward here in Gunnison. And I remember sitting there and there was a discussion. I don't remember what the discussion was. But somebody, another man, brought up the fact. He says, you know, sometimes even though we have the complete truth. Okay, it's a Mormon talking. We have the truth and they don't. Sometimes they just, you know, speaking about evangelicals, sometimes they are just so much more loving and, and, and so much more spiritual than us. You know, praying before meals and praying for you whenever and just sometimes they just worship and love so much more than what we do. And yet we have the truth. And um, I remember that. It was about a month before I, I found Christ. Maybe a month and a half. But I remember him saying that. And it stuck with me because love will indeed be an example to them as you love them, as you teach them, as you share with them the gospel. Now, some people are going to think you're not very loving, okay? Not much you can do about that. The fact is, the most loving thing you could do is tell somebody the truth, okay? It's absolutely the most loving thing you could do. You, you can stand and lie to somebody, give them beautiful words, and love them right into hell, or I mean, lie to them, lie them right into hell by telling them they're okay and that there's many ways to heaven. <laughs> or you can stand boldly on the truth that is in the Bible, that there is one way, Jesus Christ. Through his shed blood on the cross, he is the way, the truth, and the life. And that is an offense to people who are perishing. And it will continue to be an offense to people that are perishing. But if you truly love people, if you truly love God, then you will share the gospel in whatever way you can. I'm, I'm, I, I, I about ducked. <laughs> I forgot he's giving me a five-minute bell instead of hitting me with that thing. <laughs> um, so let me just recap in the, five, in the now four minutes that I have. Saturate everything you do with prayer. We all too often think that prayer, I don't know, maybe it's just me, that sometimes I think prayer is, sometimes they're bouncing off the ceiling and do they really work? Oh man, prayer is the number one thing you could do. If you're going out there without saturating your work with prayer, you are falling short. You are going into battle without a sword. You are going into battle without a shield. So pray, pray and pray some more and have a prayer in your heart when you're out there on the streets and you're out there talking to people. Saturate what you're doing with prayer. As you're talking with people, let love, not frustration, guide your path. Frustration guided Sherry and I for way too long, and it pushed our family away. We are now able to make up for that through love. So let love be your motivation. Let love be the thing that guides you. And at the end of the day, at the end of the day, what you're doing is the ultimate worship of our great God. As you are teaching people, as you are evangelizing and preaching, whether it is loud or it is quiet, 
you are worshiping God. And that's what we were made for. We were made to worship. You're fulfilling the Great Commission. Every one of you, right now. Every one of you, as Jesus stood there with his, and he told his fishermen, go out and preach my gospel. And from this little town that I went to last year on the greatest Israel tour ever, from this teeny little town, the gospel has grown to over a billion people. It has spread throughout the world because people followed what Jesus said by spreading his gospel. So what you're doing dates back 2,000 years to where Christ said, go out and spread the gospel. Teach people. God bless you for what you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I made it.